Well, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to our lunchtime seminar. Um, our guest is Carlos Andre Garcia Rublio. Rublido, I am terribly sorry. <laughs> um, and um, he will be talking to us about uh, the resilience of insect populations uh, in the face of global warming. Uh, for those of you who wish to um, ask questions, uh, please put them into the chat box and we will uh, field the questions at the end of Carlos's um, speech. Uh, he will be talking for about 45 minutes, so there'll be plenty of time for discussion and questions at the end. Um, so I am pleased to welcome Carlos. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Ecology and Environmental Biology at University of Connecticut, my old alumni spot. He's a prolific author teacher and researcher with a current focus on tropical ecology and insects. Insects are the canaries in the coal mine. Um, they are hypersensitive to environmental change and have the ability to adapt physically within very short periods of time when allowed to do so. If they can't, they move. With rapidly increasing earth temperatures, particularly in the tropics, They'll either expand their ranges horizontally towards cooler, more temperate regions of the world or up into the mountain ranges. Once in the mountains, if conditions continue to deteriorate, they are trapped. Carlos will be talking about this and other factors as climate change puts pressure on insects as drivers of ecosystems and how a struggle to survive has become a fight to live. All right. And here's Carlos. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you so much, Gail. This was a, that was a really nice introduction. So everybody, uh, I heard that you were having delicious pizza. So please save some for me because I will visit later. So well, <laughs> we can get pizza together later. So yeah, so you're right. I'm going to be talking about some of our research uh, in Costa Rica, in tropical mountains, and how populations uh, of insects might be affected by warming temperatures. So, so we all know that we're losing species at an unprecedented rate. And we know that in a few decades, uh, most of the species will be at risk of extinction. And we know that the main uh, factors uh, producing those extinctions of organisms are well, habitat loss, species invasion, overhunting, and also climate change. And climate change can, produce or generate these extinctions through habitat loss. So what we have here is the typical tropical mountain uh, in the tropics where we have these different ecosystems at different elevations. You have from tropical rainforest to pre-mountain forest to lower mountain forest to mountain forest on top of the mountains. And the temperatures get colder with elevation, right? And what it is expected is that with, with an increase of about three to six Celsius degrees, uh, Celsius degrees in the next century, this is what is going to happen. You're going to have this shift of ecosystems uphill. You're going to have new temperatures in the lowlands. And we don't know what is going to happen with those uh, organisms living in the lowlands. You are going to have these new temperatures. And people call these the biotic attritions. Maybe they will disappear. We really don't know. But something for sure that will happen on top of the tropical mountains is that the ecosystems will either shrink or they might even disappear. And we have some information about the physiology of tropical, tropical organisms, but also temperate organisms and how they will be affected by climate change. And mostly it is about uh, ectotherms. So we have organisms that actually need to, to they, they, their temperature requirements depend on the environment. And a great example for that are insect herbivores. So we know that insect herbivores uh, or insects in general that are present at different latitudes, they have higher tolerance to higher temperatures as you're farther from the equator. That's what the theory says. However, this is something that we need to explore in this talk. Are really tropical insects more endangered by global warming than temperate insects? So this is a classic paper by the evolutionary biologist, tropical biologist, Dan Jansen, 
that is called why mountain passes are higher in the tropics. And this is currently the compass for many of the studies that are happening in climate change in these tropical mountains. And the mountain passes hypothesis predicts that because you have these mountains in the tropics with these belts of ecosystems that have really constant temperatures over the year, but as you go up the mountain, temperatures shift so drastically, then organisms have the evolutionary time, evolutionary time to adapt to those temperatures. And then you have organisms that will be adapted to those particular temperatures at those particular elevations. Whereas when you're in the temperate zone, you're gonna have seasons. So you're gonna have winters, summers, uh, and then all those organisms living in these temperate mountains will experience this shift of temperature during the year. Therefore, they have to be adapted to broader temperature ranges. And the, the, the main explanation for Janssen's hypothesis is that this is a physiological hypothesis. So what researchers usually do is to use uh, some measurement of physiology of these organisms to actually test this hypothesis, the mountain passes hypothesis. However, uh, we need to remember, and this is kind of like the main topic of my talk, the temperature at which an insect faints is not fitness. And I will repeat this multiple times. So I had this conversation with Dan Janssen uh, and he actually agreed that uh, the mountain passes hypothesis is not really a physiological hypothesis, but it is more a demograph demographic hypothesis connected to fitness. So basically the idea of the mountain passes hypothesis is that thermal niches and fitness of tropical insects are adapted to local temperatures. So we need to measure fitness. So here is my main message of this talk. Please stop heating your study organism. To model insect declines, we must measure fitness. And this is a criticism not to other studies, but particularly to my own studies. And you will see why I'm saying this. So what do we know about how ectotherms uh, fitness changes along latitudes? So this is another fundamental paper that I find like another one of my paper compass, uh, kind of like paper that actually gave me direction to the kind of questions that we answer in my laboratory. So Dutch and all, what they did was that they, they looked for uh, life tables published uh, in multiple journals. And then from these life tables, you can actually calculate fitness. And they put together this data set using these uh, life tables from different insect species at different latitudes. And then this is kind of like the main image of that paper. The main figure of this paper is that you have here the relative fitness at different temperatures so A and B for tropical insects and for temperate insect species. This is the relative fitness regarding temperature. And the main message, the message of this figure or from this life table analysis that measures fitness is that for tropical insects, uh, they, they only have a peak in their performance and their fitness at cooler temperatures that organisms that are present in the temperate zone. Now, the big panel you have to your right is actually the, the change of fitness if you simulate an increase of temperature for the to 2100, right? So you take those temperatures from those life table analysis, and then what you do is that you project fitness to future temperatures. And then you have in the X axis, you have the latitude from in the center of the equator, then you have the south, the north, that you have the you have the distribution the latitudinal distribution of that species and then what i have in the little box is the species that i was more interested in those are the tropical species and then if you have changes of fitness that go below that zero that means that fitness is reduced at future temperatures and if you have that actually that fitness goes above that zero line that means that fitness will increase so the main message is that if you increase temperatures uh, organisms that are beyond the equator will have an increase in fitness, maybe because they have warmer winters. But something that is gonna happen in the equator is that you're gonna have a reduction in fitness for all those tropical species. So I was super interested in which were those species. And then I contacted the PNAS office to track down the original data sets. And this is what I found. So all tropical insects included in this global analysis are either crop pests with broad geographic distributions or biocontrol agents usually raised in the laboratory for multiple generations. And this is not a criticism to the paper, but it is actually to show you that we know so little about fitness of organisms. We basically are assuming that we understand how fitness of tropical insects will be affected by 
climate change based all around observations in nine species of pests raised in the laboratory that will obtain those life tables. But as you know, in the tropics, we have between maybe 5 million, maybe 9 million, maybe 20 million of species. So, so I don't think that we can actually think about how tropical insects will be affected by climate change if we don't even have data on the demography and the fitness of insects in, in nature for the tropics. So if we really want to understand how fitness is affected by global, uh, global change or climate change uh, at different latitudes, so the idea would be that we would be able to actually visit all those different places in, in the planet and be able to measure fitness. So imagine that, that would be amazing, right? So imagine that you can go to any of those spots instantaneously, but I'm here giving this talk. And then after my talk, I said, okay, I want to go to, I don't know, I want to go to England. Right, visit maybe a little bit like girls' family a little bit, and then after that, I will go measure fitness in insects that are in the in, in England, and then come back to my office and so on. So imagine that that would be amazing. And actually, somebody thought about this before, and this is also another reference to England, right? Imagine if you have that device, if you had the TARDIS. So if you like a uh, science fiction, uh, you know Doctor Who. So Doctor Who is is a time master that can travel uh, in space and time in this particular spaceship that is called the TARDIS, the time and relative dimension in space. And then you can go anywhere in the world. So imagine if you could do that, you can measure fitness and then you can actually understand how insects, tropical and temperate responds to, to, to climate change. So I thought about this and this inspired a project that I'm working on that is uh, building TARDI. So actually you can travel to different places. And what is really exciting is that actually we can actually build TARDI to go to different environments, but they are super expensive. So think about this. You can produce, you can, you can build a, a growth chamber that can perfectly simulate temperatures, humidity, and so on. And that you can simulate that environment in England where those organisms are living, and you can actually expose those organisms to that. Or you can actually uh, expose them to extreme temperatures, right? Or, or so on. So, what I did is that I started this project that I call the $500 Laboratory of Interactions and Climate Change. And the whole idea is that we are gonna build equipment. We're gonna buy all these star die, but they are gonna be super cheap. And then we can actually share them with colleagues all over the world. So the objective of this project is to design accurate and inexpensive equipment to estimate thermal limits and demography rates of ectotherms at different elevations and latitudes. And what we have here, is a picture of one of these uh, TARDI workshops that we're doing where we bring equipment, like pieces of equipment. And then together with the students, we, we discuss their projects. What do they want to do for your thesis or dissertations? Then we have a workshop where we, where we design the equipment that they need to measure these physiological rates or these uh, demographic rates. And then we leave the equipment behind and then we, we, we move on to the next place to build another TARDIS. And then here are some examples of devices from these different workshops. So to your, to your left, you have a device that with like $20, you can build to measure really accurately the CTMAC, that is the highest temperature at which organisms can respond to, to the environment. But also to your right, you have this miniature freezer that you can bring to the field and you can actually calculate at which uh, the coolest temperature at which organisms can function. And here is another example. This is an incubator that we build in our laboratory and you just have to go to a place, you buy a fridge and then using an Arduino and some different components that are also like not inexpensive, then you can actually build this incubator and then you can just leave it there. And then people can perform these experiments of like changing temperatures that you can have fluctuating temperatures or you can have constant temperatures. And the accuracy of these devices is as good as a, an incubator that you can buy uh, from, uh, I don't know, like a supplier here in the US. And you don't have to go to customs or anything. So you can actually like go there, build it, and you don't have to deal with customs or anything like that. So here we have another example. So this is a space heater that you can be that you can put around structures in the field. And this is an experiment by one of my uh, students and a postdoc here in my laboratory, uh, where we are heating uh, leaves in the tropical rainforest, or you can also heat, I don't know, little ponds of water and so on and you can simulate climate change in the field. So here are some examples of the different publications coming out of this project. 
And if you want to know more about this and you want to learn about the designs, we have a GitHub where we have all the instructions, all the components uh, to be build this and other devices that we use for our different research. And we have the different targets. So we have the one that I'm gonna talk about today in Costa Rica. We have one of my colleagues in Panama, in Baro Colorado Island, in the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Uh, we have one that we finished where my collaborators are working on different topics on how organisms will respond to climate change. And one here in Connecticut that we hope to start a project using temperate insects. So, but for today's talk, I'm gonna focus on the TARDIS in Costa Rica. So these studies that I'm gonna talk about today, uh, we performed them in La Selva Biological Station, and this amazing mountain behind La Selva that is called the Braulo Carrillo National Park. And this is an amazing place. So this is the highest elevation gradient of continuous forest in Central America that goes from tropical rainforest up to mountain forest. And we have different projects happening right now. So the main, the, the core system that we use for our, for our projects are plants in the, in the banana group and all the different interactions. So I work mostly with the insect herbivores, the beetles that feed on them that I'm gonna talk about today, but also my students work with pollinators. Uh, some of them work with uh, hummingbirds visiting flowers. And there is, this, there is this group of tiny mites that feed on nectar. And the only way they can, they can move from flower to flower is by hitchhiking in the nostrils of the hummingbirds, like little airplanes, to be delivered into the next plant. Uh, we have also a group of mites. There are different mites that hitchhike on the beetles. And when the beetles leave the plant to feed on another host plant, they have to carry the mites. And if they are left behind, they can desiccate in minutes. Also, we have projects on the chemistry of the plants and how this chemistry of plants affects plant herbivore interactions and so on. But for today, I'm gonna to focus in the interaction between the plants and the insect herbivores. So the, the plants I work with that, I, that are kind of like my, my the, the love of my life in the biological world are the zingiberales, the gingers, and the banana-like plants. And these are plants from different families. So you have the heliconias, the costaceae, zingiberaceae, zingiberaceae the, 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 the gingers, marantaceae, the prayer plants, the canaceae, and so on. And a group of beetles, there is a genus that is called the genus cephaluleia that is specialized on this group of plants. And these beetles are supposed to be one of the oldest and most conservative plant herbivore interactions known so far. So this can be an interaction that can be as old as 60 million years. So you can see that there is a beetle inside that little leaf and that's really particular and this is super important for the natural history of these beetles. These beetles are also named the raw leaf beetles. And please remember that uh, these beetles, they don't roll the leaf. This is the young leaf of the host plant that is growing. And then as it grows, it stays rolled. And then eventually it will unfurl and it will open. So these beetles, what they do is that they, they, they find a host plant with a young leaf. They colonize the young leaf when it is still a, uh, it is a, it is still, it is still a little too. And then they start laying eggs, they feed on the plant. And then if you unfold any of these raw leaves in the neotropics, because these beetles are neotropical, this is what you will see. So you will have all the different species of insect herbivores interacting with these plants in that little role. So it is really convenient because if you want to know the, the diversity or the species that are interacting with, with each host plant, you, you just have to go to the plant and for the leaf and the beetles are there. So when the leaves unfold, the beetles have to fly and they have to look for another plant with a, with, with a young leaf to colonize that little role and then continue the, their life cycle. So if you want to understand extinctions and coextinctions in this system, you need to have the following information. First, you need to understand the elevational distribution of the plants and the insect herbivores. Then you have to understand the association, which beetle species is feeding on each host plant, but also you need to know the strength of the interaction, for example, the proportion of the diet uh, for each beetle species when they feed on the different plants. For example, here you have these beetle species is feeding 50% in one host plant, 30% in another one, 20% in another one. And also, well, so what we have here is a representation of our study site. So this is the La Selva Barba elevational gradient. Uh, here at the bottom, let me use my little um, laser pointer. Here is La Selva Biological Station, where we have our laboratory. 
And then we have in blue are the different shelters along this elevational gradient where we do our research too at different elevations. So if we want to understand the interactions and extinction from plants to insect herbivores, what we did was that we went all over this elevation gradient and then we identified the distribution of each host plant and each insect herbivore along this elevation gradient. And of course, this is a, this is a tropical elevation gradient. So this is what we found. Bam, a huge diversity. So imagine if you want to understand the process of extinction and co-extinction and population dynamics in this group, uh, what do you do, right? You have this huge diversity because you need to know not only the elevation of distribution of these insects and the plants, but also which beetle species is feeding on each host plant and how their diets change with elevation along this tropical mountain. So what we did for that was that um, I uh, developed a technique based on DNA to identify the diets. So this is something that we can do in the laboratory now. So the idea is that we have all the host plants from this group of uh, Zingia borealis, the banana-like plants in this tropical mountain, we collected plant tissues from every single potential host plant. We obtained DNA uh, and we obtained these short sequences of DNA, the plant DNA, and then we assembled this host plant DNA barcode library. Then after that, we develop, develop a technique where you can collect a beetle in the field. You can extract DNA from the guts of the insect. Then you can compare it to the library of DNA from the host plants. And then eventually you get something like this. You can get the interactions between the beetles and the plants using these molecular markers. So this is an example in these tropical mountains for one of the communities we work with in Costa Rica. Uh, here we have the elevational distribution uh, of each host plant. Each of the rows is one host plant along this tropical mountain from tropical rainforest to pre-mountain forest to low mountain forest, mountain forest to oak forest. And then uh, in, the, in the base are all the different beetle species in this particular mountain. And then the colors represent who is what, how the diet changes with elevation, and also what is the proportion of each host plant that you can that, that is contributing to the overall diet for all the insect herbivore community. So that's the kind of like data sets that we generate in for the, for, for the TARDUS in Costa Rica. And we know so far that uh, also we have estimates of physiology, physi physiological responses of all these insects to climate change. And these are the two mountains in Costa Rica where we work. The lines represent the elevation of distributions of different beetle species in these tropical mountains, and the colors represent their thermal limits. So as you can see here, in the low elevation of these two mountains, you have more red, so that means that they are more tolerant to high temperatures. If you, if you go to mid elevations, you see more blue, so that means that they are toler less tolerant to high temperatures. And then on top, you have these species that you can see that they are totally blue, so they are really affected by a little increase in temperature. So these beetles seem to be, at least their physiologists, are adapted to temperatures along this elevation and gradient. But there you go again, right? We need to remember that the temperature at which an insect faints, that is how you calculate those thermal limits, this is not fitness. So how can you measure fitness? And the way you estimate fitness is by understanding the population dynamics. And this is going to be the only equation that I will show in my talk and don't trust anyone who will show you an equation and doesn't explain it well. So let me see if, I'm gonna, if I do a, a good job by explaining this equation. So this is the fundamental equation of life history. And this is the, the, the kernel, the most, the, the fundamental equation that is used by every single demographic model that you can see in any publication. And the fundamental equation of life history says that if you know how long do you live and how many times do you reproduce, then you can estimate fitness. And then uh, what we're gonna focus in this talk is in a little parameter that is there in red, that is little r. So who is little r? So little r is the instantaneous population growth rate. And this is a super important parameter because this is the parameter that links ecology and evolution. So little r is the instantaneous population growth rate that is the fitness of, a, of an organism in an environment. And how do you measure little r? So we have, in the fundamental equation LX, that is survivorship. So you have a cohort, a cohort of individuals in the laboratory. And I know that you have many individuals in your laboratories, like bed bugs, for example. So if you have one, two, three, four, five, six individuals, 
that I brought to my laboratory as larvae. And then I'm gonna follow the schedule of birth and death of that cohort. So the first day we have that all the individuals are alive. The next day, one individual died. The next day, another individual died as larva. And then the next day in red, the three individuals who survived pupated. Then after that, you follow the schedule of death of this cohort. And then you find that in this day, the individual on top was an adult but died. Then the second one survived for a little bit longer. And then at the bottom is the one that survived longer. And this is called the survival shape function. But what is really interesting here is that the survival shape function is not an estimate using an equation. This is empirical. You follow your cohort. And if you know when, when all your cohort died, that you can estimate this curve that you, see, that you see on top, that is LX, the survival shape function. Now, the adults will start reproducing. So you have the schedule of birth uh, of daughters of those individuals. And then you have the number of larvae born for each one of these individuals over time. And this curve that you have here is the fecundity function. So this is how many times each one of those individuals reproduce. And then if you combine LX, how long do you live with MX? How many times you reproduce? You can estimate fitness, how fast the population can grow. All right. So that's what so that's what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna show you estimates of fitness in different environments. And remember that always fitness happens happens in an environment, and in this case, it's gonna be different temperatures. So this is our laboratory in La Selva, in Costa Rica, at the base of the Barba Volcano. And these are technicians working on different projects and different estimates of fitness for different experiments. What you have in the little incubators, those are the tardi uh, incub incubator incubators built by our project. And we have these different temperature treatments and we are raising different cohorts of different individuals from different elevations. Uh, and we are measuring fitness for all those insects in this tropical mountain. But what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna focus on one particular species uh, for this talk. So here we have one beetle species that is called Cephaloleia belti. And this is the beetle species from this genus that we know that has the broadest elevational distribution. So what we did for this particular project was that we brought beetles from these species that are at the base of the mountain where it is warm and the top of the mountain where it is cold. And then we assume that potentially those populations might be locally adapted to the different temperatures. Something that we found that was super interesting is that we sequenced uh, the, the, the gene CO1 from the mitochondria for those individuals along this elevation gradient, and we found a pattern. So you can see here to your left that we have the proportion of different haplotypes, mitochondrial haplotypes. And we found that actually you have these differences. On top of the mountain, you have a haplotype, a mitochondrial haplotype associated with cold temperatures. At the base of the mountain, you have a haplotype, a mitochondrial haplotype that is associated with warm temperatures. And then you have a hybridization zone in the middle where you can find both haplotypes, cold and, and warm uh, mitochondrial haplotypes. So, and also, also one thing that is super interesting is that you can bring the beetles to the laboratory and then you can actually raise F1s and you can produce hybrids that are fertile. So you can obtain individuals from the top of the mountain, from the bottom of the mountain, obtain an F1, and then you can obtain hybrids that can have the mitochondria from the mother from the top of the mountain or the mitochondria from the mother from the, from, from, from the lowlands. Okay, so are high and low elevation haplotypes adapted to local temperatures? So for this, we're gonna measure little r, the instantaneous population growth rate. And for this, it takes a long time. So we had to raise these cohorts of beetles that we collected at high and low elevation, obtain eggs, and then raise those beetles for over three years to estimate fitness. So that's why we don't have really that many estimates of fitness at different temperatures, because it takes a really long time to obtain an estimation of little r, fitness in an environment. In this case, it takes three years for each data point. So also something that we have, uh, it's a data set of really good uh, temperature data for this tropical mountain. So we have records of temperature to your left uh, along this tropical mountain that were collected every half an hour for four years. So we have this long-term data set of temperatures collected every half an hour for four years. So we actually know the different temperatures that are at, at, in those different environments where those hybrids are present. 
And the first experiment is that we obtained males and females from the different elevations, so high elevation and low elevation, and then we obtained an F1. And those are pure haplotypes uh, from, from high elevation and low elevation, and then we raise them to different temperatures, to 10 Celsius degrees, 15 Celsius degrees, 20, 25, and 30. And the rationale of using these constant temperatures is that using those five temperatures, you can simulate the mean, the mean max, and minimum temperatures in each elevation. So for example, uh, in the tropical rainforest at the base of the mountain, the mean temperature is around 25 Celsius degrees. The maximum temperature is 30, and the lowest temperature is 20. If you go to the next elevation, the mean temperature is going to be 20, the maximum will be 25, and the lowest will be 15, and so on. So using those five temperatures, you can have actually an estimation of what is going to be the normal reaction of each one of those different cohorts raised in the laboratory at the different and at the extreme and the mean temperatures along this elevation gradient. So our high and low elevation haplotype is adapted to local temperatures. So here are the results of raising those insects in the laboratory. So on top are the high elevation and at the bottom is the low elevation haplotypes. And these are the results for larvae. So these are survivorship of larvae over time. And basically for high elevation uh, individuals, larvae can only survive at 15 and 25 and 20 Celsius degrees. Whereas in the low elevation, uh, larvae can survive at 20 and 25 Celsius degrees. Adults, high elevation haplotypes can survive at between 15 and 20, low elevation 20 and 25. And this is fecundity, the number of eggs laid by this uh, of larvae per female uh, uh, obtained from each one of those females. And again, we have that the high elevation uh, haplotype, their fecundities are adapted to cold temperatures, whereas the low elevation haplotype is adapted to warmer temperatures. And these are the estimates of fitness. So basically, the conclusion is that these pure haplotypes present at high elevation and low elevation, they are locally adapted to different temperatures. And the high elevation can only survive in temperatures between 15 to 20 Celsius degrees, whereas the low elevation haplotype can survive uh, at temperatures between 20 and 25 Celsius degrees. So they are locally adapted to their temperatures. So now, we need to figure out if high and low elevation haplotypes are pre-adapted to future, to future warming conditions. And that's a key question, no? Because we need to know if those haplotypes are locally adapted to these narrow temperatures at these elevations, are they gonna be able to cope with climate change? So for that, what we did is that we use this long-term data set of temperatures along this elevation gradient. So we have this data set that is like every half an hour, we measure the temperature for 40 years, so we're, we're gonna use that particular data set at each elevation to project what is gonna be the potential fitness, the little R that we were talking about before in each one of the different populations for the different haplotypes. So I don't want you to go through this function with me, but it is basically you have the normal reaction of the different cohorts of uh, haplotypes raised at different temperatures, and that gives you some different slopes. And then using that, you can actually use these lines to connect the fitness estimated in between like different temperatures with the temperatures in the mountain. And then you can actually make, generate these kind of like fitness profiles uh, at each elevation based on the real temperatures uh, that are present at each different elevation. And then you can project the effects of temperature increase by just, by, by just simulating a temperature increase of one, two, three, four, five, or six Celsius degrees in the data set. And then that will, that will give you the potential increase or decrease in fitness for those populations in the different bands of the, of the mountain. And we can talk more about that, but it was a, this is a really interesting analysis. And I think this is the first analysis that actually was able to estimate using this empirical data from wild populations, what is gonna be the response, the real response to temperature of wild populations in these tropical mountains, okay? Excellent. So I'm gonna show you the results for these simulations of increasing climate change in temperatures along this mountain. So we have here to your left, the result for the low elevation haplotype that is adapted to warm temperatures. And then we have two metrics. The first one is the population growth decline rates. So how many from the total of the, of, of the data set, how many, in how many instances you have population growth or population decline, and also the projected fitness, that is the summation of fitness over the period of time uh, when you have these particular temperatures. And then you have these simulations for low for lowland forests, the warm uh, the warm forest in the lowlands, pre mountain forest that is the mid elevation, and then the top of the mountain. So here we have the the first result, and I want you to go with me. 
So in, in orange is the, 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 the number of instances that the, where we observe in the data set population growth at current temperatures. So increase of zero beyond current temperatures. And then you have the projected fitness. You have that actually here, you have population growth, right? Now I'm gonna simulate an increase of one Celsius degree in the same data set. I oh, know, sorry. Now we're gonna to go to the next elevation, pre-montane. Now we have that for the low elevation haplotype, you have a reduction in the proportion of instances of population growth and also fitness. And then on top of the mountain, you have population decline. And that's what we observed in the laboratory and we see next, right? So these estimates of fitness match the actual distribution of this haplotype along the mountain. And now we're gonna increase the temperature one Celsius degree all over the mountain. In the lowlands, we have a slightly de a slight decrease in fitness uh, at, at low elevation, at mid elevation, high elevation still, we have no fitness. But look at this, if you increase temperature only by two Celsius degrees in the lower range of this haplotype, you're gonna population growth switches to population decline, only two Celsius degrees. And this is the result for the haplotype, uh, the high elevation haplotype. Basically, the result is that in the in the lower boundary of the populations, you're gonna have population decline with only two Celsius degrees increase, but in the higher boundary of the distribution, those are gonna become refugia to climate change. So they don't become extreme even at the extreme, uh, the most extreme uh, scenario of climate change. So both haplotypes will become locally extinct at the bottom of their ranges with an increase in temperature beyond two Celsius degrees but high elevation ranges and thermal will, uh, will become thermal refugia to global warming. Okay, so now we know that they are hybridizing. So what is happening in this hybrid zone? Are these hybrids gonna be more uh, resilient to climate change or maybe not? What is gonna happen with these uh, organisms that are hybridi hybridizing and producing these hybrids in the, in, the, in, in the middle of the mountain? So I have two hypotheses. So the first hypothesis, I call it the hot mitochondria hypothesis. And it is that when you have this in it, mitochondria is associated, associated with respiration and respiration is one of the main uh, processes affected by temperature. And actually when you're heating your study organism and you see like the fainting of the insects, what is happening is that there is some like respiration enzyme that is failing and then that's why insects collapse. So that makes sense that maybe the mitochondria genome can be associated with temperatures at each elevation and actually the adaptation is just by mitochondria. And then if you have this hot versus cold mitochondria, it'll be super easy to understand what is happening if you produce hybrids with one mitochondria that is from high elevation or low elevation. And we all know that mitochondria in most instances is maternally inherited. So we can actually know if the F1 hybrids have high elevation or low elevation mitochondria. The second hypothesis is that you have this genome decoupling that can actually affect fitness uh, of these hybrids. So in this case, what we expect is that by you changing the, the, the origin of mitochondrial genome and nuclear genome, maybe you're, you're gonna have maladaptation in extreme temperatures. So for example, if you have high elevation mitochondria that is adapted to cold temperatures, but you have the low elevation nucleus, maybe what, you, what, is, what is gonna happen is that because you decouple the two genomes, then those organisms won't be able to exist in extreme temperatures, like for example, high elevation or low elevation. Okay, so for this, what we performed was, was a, an F1 hybrid cross where we, where, where we obtained high elevation, low elevation, pure individuals. Then we made it high elevation females with low elevation males and the opposite to obtain a female mitochondria from high, a mitochondria, a mitochondria from high elevation individuals, blue here, half and half segregation of nuclear uh, genome. And then we have the opposite, right? So we have like the, a low elevation mitochondria, and then 50%, 50% a nuclear genome for the other a set of hybrids. And then we raise these individuals a, at 15, 20, and 25 Celsius degrees, and we measure fitness. So what we have here are the results for larval survival for the a, hybrids with models from high elevation and hybrids with models from low elevation. And the result is that for both of them, larvae only survive or survive better at intermediate temperatures, right? 20 Celsius degrees. So this is the temperature in the middle of the mountain. But look at what happened with the adults. Adults for both hybrids survive, uh, survival is higher at cool temperatures. So adults 
sur survival is higher at temperatures at the top of the mountain. And then if you look at fecunderies, fecundity is higher at temperatures in the lowlands. So there is a total decoupling of these vital rates for hybrids. So I'm gonna summarize these results in this uh, little table. So this is an example of how am I gonna sum summarize the main results. So here we have, for example, the high elevation haplotype that is adapted to, adapted to cold temperatures. And in this case, we have uh, all the vital rates are coupled to the environment. So larva uh, survival, adult longevity and fecundity are similar at temperature two. But then in a scenario where you have this uh, decoupling of vital rates could be this. You have that larvae survive better at temperature two, but then adults survive better at temperature one and fecundity is higher at temperature one. So I'm gonna summarize the results for the different uh, experiments. So here we have again, the different elevations in this tropical mountain from low elevation, mid elevation, high elevation. And then we have the, the high elevation haplotype adapted to cold temperatures, the low elevation hap haplotype adapted to warm temperatures, hybrids with models from high elevation, hybrids from low elevation. And then I'm gonna show you what happens with the different vital rates. For the haplotype at high elevation, we have that at high elevation and mid elevation, all the vital rates are coupled, right? So we have the survivorship of larvae, fecundity, uh, uh, longevity of adults and fecundities are coupled and happen at the right temperatures. For the low elevation, local adaptation, right? So we have, again, this example of like, you have larval survival, adult uh, longevity, fecundity, happens in the same environments at the same temperatures. But for the hybrids, we have a different story. For the hybrids, we have that adults survive better at the coldest temperatures, uh, larvae do better at intermediate temperatures and fecundity is higher at the warmest temperatures. And it is the same result for the hybrids uh, with mitochondria from uh, the low elevation, from the high elevation. So this supports hypothesis to the coupling of mitochondria and nuclear genome reduces thermal tolerance. So it seems that if you have these hybrids uh, interacting with different environments, they can only survive in the intermediate um, temperatures in the middle of the mountain. So basically they are, the hybrids will be trapped in this sandwich in the mountain, these intermediate temperatures. And we still are analyzing the data of fitness to actually understand if they will be actually more affected by climate change or not uh, than the pure haplotypes from high elevation and low elevation. So in conclusion, the mountain passes hypothesis predicts that temperature stability along tropical mountains promotes local adaptation and speciation. And mountain passes are, but what we found out here is that mountain passes are even higher in tropical, uh, in the tropics than we previously thought. And actually not only species, but actually populations are adapted to temperatures along tropical mountains. Mountain passes are especially high in the hybrid zones and hybrids are maladapted to extreme temperatures. And just an increase of temperature of two Celsius degrees will trigger demographic attrition, pushing species and population boundaries to the limit of tropical mountain passes and they might disappear. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. That was a very interesting talk. Um, I just want to check in with the chat, Kim. Um, are there any questions? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you were checking, Carlos, when you're checking the fecundity, were you um, counting egg production and whether there was any anomalies in the production of eggs? Yeah, so the way we measure fecundity is you have this, you have, we, we measure lifetime fecundity. So we have these females uh, that we follow from birth to death. They start producing eggs in the 14th day, more or less. Mm -hmm. they, 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 are, they are receptive in the 14th day, the second week, more or less. And then we, schedule, we follow the schedule of fecundity of each female every week till they die. So it could be like three years. So we have this estimate of the number of eggs laid and then uh, the number of females from each egg uh, produced for their lifetime. So that's how we measure fecundity. So it is a lot of work. Okay. Now, um, has there been any in, uh, look, you know, examination as far as predation on these things? As you know, is the predation pressures at the different levels? depending on who's hunting them? 
Yeah, right. So, so that's an experiment that we are trying to put together in a proposal that I'm actually submitting soon on NSF proposal. So the effects of top-down uh, top down effects on insect herbivores are poorly known mm -hmm. uh, in the tropics, especially like how are they going to be affected by climate change? I don't think there is a paper uh, where they actually tested what is going to be the effect of increasing temperatures on, on these predators and how they're going to affect actually these population dynamics. So one thing that the one thing that I'm doing now is when I show you the results, the the, the device that you can put around the leaves to, to simulate climate change. So we have an experiment where we have you have these raw leaves and then you have these different these different organisms that are preying upon the, the, the insect herbivores. So you have uh, spiders, you have staphylinid beetles, you have a, a group of carabid beetles that are specialized on these beetles, you have parasitoids, so you have a bunch of calcidoids that are, yeah. So you have all this universe of interactions happening there. So for my postdocs project, we did this experiment and we designed those, exp those devices to have those communities like experiencing current temperatures and also we simulated temperatures in increases. And then the main result from those experiments is that you have a decrease in some of the trophic levels more than others. So for example, like it seems that predators are less, uh, are more affected by increasing temperatures than herbivores. And that suggests that maybe you're gonna have a, some sort of like maybe enemy release potentially if you have increased increased temperatures. And that's something that we're gonna try to do like like how actually the the the, the estimates of demography in the laboratory and then have real estimates of predation of all those predators in the field. And then we can connect those two different estimates. Now you have the vital rates that are the fundamental vital rates and then you have predation. You can do stuff like, for example, you can, you can, you can bring eggs from the laboratory, put them in the plants, mm -hmm. and then you can collect them one week after, and then you can see the parasitoids already growing on the egg. So you can calculate the, the proportion of parasitoidism happening. Uh, for the beetles, we use this little uh, microfiber like leeches, kind of like little dogs, dog leeches, and then you put them around the, the, the pronotum, and then you, then you put them back into the leaf, and the beetles can live for like, I, we kept beetles like living inside the little leaves like for weeks. You can take them out, put them in another one, and then you can follow them like just tie the, the little string to the, to the leaf, and then you can actually follow predation. And then you find the exoskeletons eaten by the predators and the leash sitting there, right? So that's how you can measure predation for those beetles. All right, we have some questions now. Um, so Washington De Silva asks or says, great presentation, Carlos, which is true. I, I would also say great presentation. Has anyone looked into the effects of climate change in the symbiotic organisms in insects? For example, gut bacteria and garden fungi on leaf cutting ants. I don't know if it is like I, I I think that it is what is comp, what what is complex is how to figure out how to calculate the effects of climate change on something as you saw in my presentation right you you know that you have all the different symbionts and so on how can you actually do the warming experiment so I I wish somebody is doing it I don't know maybe yes right now for the for the particular group we work with the beetles we 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 have this strange observation that. When we are raising, for example, the beetle, the, the locally adapted beetles that we were talking about in this talk, the high elevation and low elevation beetles, all the all the larvae were dying when we started like raising them in the laboratory, and we didn't know what was happening. So what we did was uh, we had to add to the to the leaves uh, offered to the to the larvae uh, some water with frost from the parents. And then they start to survive. And so there is some like something about the microbiome that these insects actually need from from the from the parents. We don't know if like this because uh, we didn't have really like, like time to do like the experiment of uh, experiment of offering high elevation versus low elevation frost because that will duplicate the amount of like sample size that we need for everything. So we did a mix of everything just to offer them everybody. But it is possible, right? There can be like an effect of local adaptation, different microbiomes in the insects. There's an effect of microbiomes on, on this herbivores for sure. So that's super interesting. I wish that we, we could learn more about it. Okay, we have another question. How does adaptation rate compare with the rate of change of temperature due to climate change? How would this affect your conclusions? So yeah, so that's a really good question. So one thing that, something that, that I need to be super open about this is that I was complaining about people, including me, hitting my study organism. And that's kind of like my response of what is gonna happen. 
and this is, this is not true, right? I'm saying that fitness is the way of measuring it, but one thing that is missing in those models is evolution, right? So that makes sense. No, those models are models where the descendants are doing exactly the same that the the parents were doing. There is no evolution included in these in these models. So, but actually, you can measure the rate of, of adaptation, and you can do it. No, so what, we have experiments where we have for these beetles, we have a we know who is the mother of the different sons and daughters in the laboratory, and you can actually calculate heritability of different traits associated with climate change. Mm -hmm. And we have the typical normal norm reaction uh, when you have the same genotype in different environments and you can calculate the speed of evolution using those analysis. It is broad sense heritability because you have also maternal effects and so on, right? But what we found in one, one paper that we just published, uh, I think like it was like last year or this year, is that uh, there is not enough heritability in these populations to cope with climate change and actually uh, these forests are warming up like super fast, so th something like 0.6 Celsius degrees uh, every 10 years, something like that. They're already lagging behind climate change. So those populations in the lowlands are already lagging behind uh, increased temperatures right now. So that's bad news, right? Yes. And that's something that I want to do eventually, connect those broad sense heritability estimates with demography. So far, we have kind of like the two parts that need to be corrected. Oh, that's all the questions we have so far, and unless anybody wants to put more questions into the chat. Well, Carlos, I think there are, you, you've run us dry. You've done a wonderful <laughs> job, a uh, beautiful presentation. Um, little sobering to say the least um and so you know it's a lesson to the wise um but you know Carlos thank you very much for presenting and uh we're looking forward to hosting you here personally and having a tour of the station so you can get to know us and um and that'll be in the near future so again Carlos thank you very much for a wonderful presentation thank you so and much everybody you, and thank you everyone for uh, dropping in and listening take care wonderful Thank you.